Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Wonderful. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started uh, because we have a full 28 minutes uh, until we're going to try to stick to our schedule as much as possible um, so that you can get to sessions right away. So uh, welcome to, uh, the, it's not really the first annual. There used to be CAPQ uh, conferences in the past, but it's been a few years. So welcome to the newly revised annual uh, CAPQ Tech Fest here at the Thomas Charter School. Uh, my name is Joe Wood. I am the Instructional Technology Coordinator here at the Thomas Charter. And I'm also the treasurer for CAPQ. Um, and I'm actually going to be doing an opening keynote. So we're going to kind of uh, get everything together all at once. So this is the CAPQ Tech Fest. As you can see, it's September 28th. Um, all of our resources for the event today are online at capq.org. Um, and if you're a Twitter user, and if not, hopefully by the end of the day you will be. You'll find some reasons to use it. Uh, the hashtag that we're using for today's event is CAPQ13. So you can tag any tweets or Facebook posts or Google+, Plus, whatever social media you use with that hashtag. <clears throat> so I mentioned there is uh, all of our resources are online. <clears throat> I'm getting over a cold that my lovely niece gave me. Um, and uh, anyways, and we do have guest wireless. Um, it's CAPQ13 for both the network name and the password. And um, all of the session evaluations are online on our online uh, uh, calendaring platform sketch. So if you could make sure you fill out the sessions for uh, the evaluations, I should say, for the sessions you go to, that would be great. Uh, it helps to provide feedback for us about the event and also for the presenters themselves. Um, moving along, I would like to say thank you, first of all, uh, to my school, the Thomas Charter. Um, specifically, though, to Dr. Ting Sun, who I believe is up in the back. You can wave your arm, Ting. There she is. Um, she's uh, one of our founders and executive director, as well as Charlie Leo, who's also one of our founders, and we, someone we have to thank, along with Ting, for being here today. So thank you very much. The two guys that I am fortunate enough to call teammates, uh, Joe Cook and Sean Canty, they're up in the very, very back of the room. Um, they're here for IT support. And then uh, his name's not up here, but we would definitely be not functioning well today without Francisco Barajas, who's our custodian for the day. So thank you to Francisco. And then certainly thank you to all of the presenters who came from near and far. We have presenters from Modesto, Silicon Valley, Lake Tahoe, all over Sacramento. So thank you for giving of your time today and uh, being willing to share what, what you know and what you've learned with uh, teachers in the area. Bella Brew Cafe brought in our breakfast today. Um, and if this afternoon when you go to lunch, I would suggest going over to Bella Brew. It's actually pretty close by. Um, they have good food. Thank you to all the volunteers and then to my uh, co-members of the CAPQ board. Uh, you know, without you, this event certainly would not happen, especially Kim Harrison. So if everyone give Kim Harrison a round of applause. <laughs> She's our CAPQ president and definitely, uh, you know, the reason why we're here today. So in terms of being able to continue the learning, there's lots of opportunities in the area. We have the Fall Q conference in October in American Canyon, a.k.a. Napa Valley. Um, we have what we're calling the CAPQ Snow Tech Fest in January, which will be a Google workshop for educators, followed by a ski fest at Alder Creek Middle School in Truckee. If you can make it to Palm Springs in the spring for the annual Q conference, it's a great opportunity. And then last year, raise your hand if you went to Q Rockstar Lake Tahoe. Was there anyone here who went to that? An amazing event. It was our first one. And it will be occurring this year. Um, I'm not <clears throat> supposed to publicize the date yet, but it's in the summer. And um, you might want to be around town, I don't know, the end of June um, to, to attend this particular event. So overview of the day. We have opening keynote in uh, two sessions, session one and two. Then we have a collaborative lunch from 11.20 to 12.50. Yes, you read that right, 90 minutes for lunch. The reason why is I know that most of you normally get 30 if you're lucky, and that doesn't include the bathroom break and the tutoring and everything else that you do at lunch, making photocopies. Um, but it's 90 minutes to go out into the community. Feel free to visit a bunch of restaurants that are right down Del Paso with friends. Make friends if you don't have any that are already here with you because um, it's an opportunity to network and collaborate. Then we'll come back in the afternoon. We'll have a brief little raffle in the multi-purpose room where you started out this morning um, and an opportunity to sign back in, especially if you're from a district that needs a sign-in sheet for morning and afternoon. And then uh, we'll have sessions three and four and then a closing raffle at the end of the day. So with that, I'm going to switch over here to a different presentation. So we'll talk a little bit about creating the schools our students need. 
So I mentioned, um, well, let me back up for a second. So I already said my name, I'm Joe Wood. But the one thing I didn't mention is if you are a Twitter user, I'm UCD Joe on Twitter. I, I went to UC Davis. And when your name is Joe Wood, every combination of that has already been taken. And so UCD Joe was my actually my AOL instant messenger name way back when I went to college. And um, it sort of kept it. So if you're uh, on Twitter, you know, go ahead and uh, follow me, and I'll follow you back. Love sharing resources. So I mentioned that um, I'm the instructional technology coordinator for Natoma's Charter School, and I'm fortunate because I, I look across the room and I see lots of friends and and former colleagues, and I'm excited to share our school with you today. Um, if you're not familiar with our school, we actually were started 20 years ago, and um, we consist of five academies. So we have an elementary school called Star Academy. We have a homeschool program called the Pact Academy. Uh, we have a, a middle school program called Leading Edge that's sort of a thematic project-based learning academy. We have a 612 Performing and Fine Arts Academy. So when you walk around this campus, all the art that you're seeing is student-produced art from the Performing and Fine Arts Academy. And then we have a virtual learning high school uh, that used to be an independent study program, but now sort of a blended learning online high school known as VLA. Kind of giving you that lay of the land because a number of our presenters and attendees are from this school, so you might hear them talking about things, and you're like, VLA, what's that? And so just so you're a little bit aware of our school. Um, and our school has sort of interesting things that are going on on a regular basis. This week, uh, we had visitors from, a, uh, from Palestine. They were a Palestinian dance group um, as part of a cultural inter-exchange with our school. And then yesterday, uh, we actually had students visiting from the Beijing Opera Institute. Um, if you've never seen Chinese opera, it is nothing like American opera. It's absolutely amazing. And uh, if you haven't had enough of our school by the end of the day, um, tonight, there's actually a performance right here on this very stage uh, by the students from the Beijing Opera Institute. And this is um, one of the pictures of one of the students. So it's kind of, uh, this school has a tendency to be very um, kind of multicultural, multicultural and innovative uh, school. But it's also a school where we use quite a bit of technology. So for instance, uh, in the spring, one morning, we got up at the crack of dawn so that we could video conference with George Millier's great, great granddaughter um, as we were preparing for a production of A Trip to the Moon. It's also a school where you might go into a classroom, and as part of an English assignment, kids are building video games um, using a tool called GameStar Mechanic. Or it's a school where you might walk in and think that Barbie is hanging from a noose. She's really not hanging from a noose, but that was the thought that I had when I walked into the classroom. Um, if you notice, what's actually happening here is students are using their personal cell phones to do stop motion animation anti-bullying videos. Uh, we had, like most schools, you know, we have middle school students, so sometimes bullying can come up as a problem. And so our way to tackle that problem was to have students develop the solutions. So what I want to talk to you, though, is a little bit about how do we create the schools that our students need. It's the journey that we're on here at Natoma's Charter School. So I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about where we have been. So I'm going to take you back in time for a moment, way, way, way back in time to 1994. So really not that long ago. But I just want you to watch this. And the good news on the live TV is this website address is actually more confusing for them than the actual internet. Listen to this. Whatever I want. With the A, the little red one, the cat. So the show is about. Yeah. Oh. But I never heard that. 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 I love this video. But see, 1984 wasn't that long ago. And it was actually our first year as a school that we started 20 years ago. But to think that's where we started. You know, on the Today Show, Brian Dumble and Katie Kirk couldn't figure out what the internet was. And if you looked at the symbols in the video, they didn't even have the hat symbol yet in their chroma key. They had to come up with an A and a circle around it as a way to do the symbol. So that's where we were 20 years ago. Now, this is where we're at now. Okay. What was it? You said you were having a problem earlier? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, once you read more about the record, the story meeting, let's see what you're going to start with.
I'm actually going to pause it right there. I don't show that video because I think books are bad. Books are amazing, and we should have libraries filled with books and classrooms filled with books that are sold. But what I do show is that I show that video because our students and, and us as well, because we all laugh at the video, we have completely new expectations of text and what we're able to access and what we're able to produce as a result of having such ubiquitous internet access. And that's really kind of where we're at. And, and truthfully, this video is five years old. So even in itself, it's starting to become a little bit dated, compared with what I like to think of as where we're going. Say okay, class. Okay, class. So that's my nephew. His name is Caden. He was uh, all of four this summer when um, we acquired as a family a pair of Google Glasses. Um, you can try these on today if you would like to. Um, and it's been very interesting to sort of watch their reaction to these particular devices and really the, expect, the new expectations they have of the world that can be so easily crafted for them. And so I go back to thinking about when I started teaching, which is a little over 10 years ago. My first year of teaching was second grade. Yes. And then I went to middle school the next year because they wet their pants and need their shoes tight way too often. <laughs> But all of these kids are now adults. They're all in college. Some of them have started families. And so if I'm still teaching the same scripted Hood Mifflin curriculum that I taught in 2003 when I had these kids, there's no way it's still meeting the needs of the kids that are coming into our classrooms. Because the world has dramatically changed. And I see that in my own family. I don't have kids yet, um, but I do have two nephews, one of them you whom you already saw. And they used to live in Europe. They now live down the street from me. Uh, but one year for Christmas when I lived in Europe, I selfishly sent them iPod touches because I wanted to be able to video conference with them. My brother on the right is not the most tech savvy person in the world. So the iPod touches went pre-set up because they wouldn't have gotten set up otherwise. <laughs> this was the picture my sister-in-law posted on Facebook the next day. And the caption was, Caden, who's two and a half at this point, teaching daddy how to use Google Maps. <laughs> and he is the most tech savvy person in the family. He learned to read by figuring out how to read. It says iTunes password. Can I have your iTunes password? Or I want to download the Superman app. Or I want to download the other hero app. He's a little bit of an app porter, so that's something we're going to have to work on. But it's interesting to watch his development through the lens of technology. And he has an older brother as well, Jordan. And this was actually a couple months, about a month ago. We went to the Walt Disney Family Museum. How many of you have been to that museum in San Francisco? If you've not been there, you should put that on your list. It's an amazing museum to go to. And Jordan is very interested in art. And so when we went into this particular room, which these are all of the uh, individual cells of Steamboat Willie, and trying to show him how you know, a cartoon is made one cell at a time, he pulls out his phone and starts taking pictures. And I said, well, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I think I can put these pictures in like a movie app, and then I can make my own version of the cartoon. And he stood there for almost an hour taking pictures of every single cell of Steamboat Willie and then asking me to hold him up so he can reach the ones at the top. And so, you know, there's a, a researcher at Cal State Dominguez Hills named Larry Rosin. And he's named this generation the I generation. And for him, a lot of it comes from the devices they have access to, whether it's a Wii, an iPod Touch, an iPhone, etc. But what he's really kind of found is that this generation, because of their access to technology, has new expectations for what learning should look like. Learning should be individualized. It should have immediate feedback. It should have interaction, and it should have engagement. In many ways, it's the great teaching that I sadly like to think of having before we had the scripted curriculum. You know, when I think back to when I was a student in elementary school, we did fun things. We had like luau's, we had art projects, we were doing what I didn't know at the time, but it was writing workshop and reading workshop without any technology. But it had these elements in it. So when we're thinking about teaching this generation, it's not about having technology. Technology is a great tool to have in your classroom, and you certainly should find ways to bring it in. But it's really thinking about what an instructional approaches am I using that are going to help me individualize learning, provide immediate feedback, allow a high degree of interaction and engagement, 
and then we're meeting the needs of the students. You know, in this picture right here, this is actually at Mirror Woods this summer, they see a banana slug, and the first thing they want to do is take pictures of it and look it up on the internet. You know, Uncle Joe, can we have your phone? Because we know it has internet. We want to learn more about the banana slug. And that's really the type of thing that technology is providing to them. And personally, I think we're living in exciting times. I know some people are scared to death of, <clears throat> excuse me, Common Core, um, the next generation science standards, or Smarter Balanced. All right. One second. I'm really going to have to start, stop hanging out with kids so much. They seem to make me sick all the time. So anyways, um, I think we're living in very exciting times. And it's specific to Common Core, I think a lot of people don't realize how um, significant digital literacy and technology skills are part of these standards. There are actually portraits of college and career readiness. And one of them is technology. And this is what it says. It says, they, being the students, use technology and digital media strategically and capably. Students employ technology thoughtfully to enhance their reading, writing, speaking, listening, and language use. They tailor their searches online to acquire useful information efficiently, and they integrate what they're using technology with what they're learning offline. They're familiar with the strengths and limitations of various technological tools and mediums, and can select and use those best suited to their communication goals. As you read through this portrait, there's three parts. They can conduct online research, they can, can, they can integrate what they're learning online with what they're learning face-to-face -face or offline. Those two things should not be shocking. It's 2013. Hopefully they're already doing some online research and they're integrating what they're learning online with what they're learning offline. The part, though, that should be surprising is the part down at the bottom. They're familiar with the strengths and limitations of various technological tools and mediums and can select and use those best suited to their communication goals. Do your kids know when it's most appropriate to use a blog? or a video, or a handwritten essay, or a drawing, or a picture, or a musical production. And that's what we have to start thinking about, is how do we help kids think about their audience and their purpose and the types of projects they're creating for any class, not just English, for math, for science, for digital arts, for music, for social studies, for all of the classes, because that's where they need to move. And with that, I thought it would be interesting to play a little game of guess the grade level. So these are directly from the Common Core. So let me read the first one. With guidance and support from adults, explore a variety of digital tools to produce and publish writing, including collaboration with peers. Turn to your neighbor and guess the grade level. <clears throat> All right, you ready for the answer? Kindergarten. So if your kindergartners don't have access to digital tools or opportunities to maybe use collaborative tools, how are you going to master the standard? Next one, evaluate the advantages and disadvantages of using different mediums. For example, print or digital text, video, multimedia, to present a particular idea. Same thing, turn to your neighbor press the grade level. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, here we go. This one is a grade. So not nearly as scary, hopefully, the middle school students. But remember, these are the grade level standards. We're mastering it by that grade level, which means we've seen it in earlier grades. It doesn't just magically appear in any grade. And the last one, with some guidance and support from adults, use technology, including the internet, to produce and publish writing, as well as to interact and collaborate with others. Demonstrate sufficient command of keyboarding skills to type a minimum page of a minimum of one page in a single setting. When turn the person next to you. Guess the grade level. <clears throat> All righty. Ready? Fourth grade. Now. How many of you are out of school where fourth graders share the computer lab with 800 other students? How many of you are out of school where maybe there is no computer lab teacher? You are the teacher. How many of you are out of school where there's no real collaborative tools, maybe like a, you know, a Microsoft Office 365 or Google Apps or something like that? How are you going to master the standard by fourth grade? 
That's something we really have to think about. And what I always say to people is, you know, it's important to teach kids typing. I know I took typing classes on an actual typewriter. I wasn't even keyboarding yet. But I didn't really learn how to type until AOL Instant Messenger came out. And I wanted to keep up with my friends so they couldn't get ahead of me. And so it's not just teaching kids how to type. It's giving them an authentic reason to type. And so whether that's a word process essay or blogging or a writer's workshop or something like that, it's really giving them a purposeful reason to use the tools that we're providing. And so I'm excited about Common Core because it emphasizes communication, real world, real world relevance. It, if you read the standards, if you're not doing higher order thinking, you're going to be lost. It definitely demands that. Values research and problem solving. Builds literacy in the content areas. I taught middle school science. When I, my first year of middle school science, my literacy training in a wonderful school district in Central Valley was to go to the Houghton Mifflin workshop. That provided me no skills. So really starting to think of, you know, for science, social studies, and math, what does literacy look like there? And embedding technology skills and media literacy. It's not about dropping your kids off at the computer lab for 30 minutes of prep. That's a fine place to plant some seeds with your students, but really bringing them into technology in your classroom. And so, you know, we definitely live in a changing world. Our uber goal that we call it here at Thomas Charter is we're here to develop the knowledge, skills, dispositions, and aptitudes students need in order to be successful for an indeterminate future. Hopefully, all of you are working with a similar goal. Because we live in a world where we have no idea what career field these kids are going into. We live in a world where 20 years ago, there was this newfangled thing called the internet. And now I can wear it on my face. We, we live in a world where our kids are going home and they're producing YouTube videos, they're making video games, they're creating Minecraft worlds. And so how do we make sure that education is relevant to them and prepares them for this indeterminate future? And so it may feel a little bit like a Rubik's Cube puzzle as you're, as you're sitting here listening. How am I possibly going to do this? Well, here are some helpful hints that I've learned along the way. First of all, there are none of these. <laughs> if any vendor tells you they have the Common Core solution, please turn around and walk out. They don't have the Common Core solution. There's no scripted curricula that you're going to be able to buy or a pacing guide or this one digital tool that's going to meet all of our Common Core, next generation science standards, smarter balance needs. The silver bullet is really going to be helping teachers improve their instructional practice. And so the first place I would start as a teacher is where do I, what am I already doing and where can I make some thoughtful connections? What standards exist that I'm trying to teach? What within my curriculum needs a digital makeover? And here's a helpful hint. If you hate that project, so do your kids. If you're bored with it, so are they. So that may be a place to look at giving some digital makeovers, whether it's the way you present content, you know, maybe you're trying to think about flip teaching, or maybe it's the type of instruction you're doing. Maybe you're going to do some project-based learning, or you're going to bring in Minecraft, um, or the types of assessment that you're giving kids, you know, with the types of projects that they're making. And the other hint, I know, you're all here on Saturday at the crack of dawn. You're overachievers. So make just one change. Don't change everything. You'll be in tears at the end of the day if you do. Trust me, I used to be that teacher. Make just one change and really ask yourself, what am I cutting? What am I keeping? You know, don't try to have it all, but make one change. Maybe it's a little day digital makeover. What am I going to cut, though, in order to make that happen? I also think you really have to think about students as producers. So where can you incorporate maybe research or media literacy or problem solving or technology skills? And you really, as a school, have to start thinking about how do I develop a shared culture of literacy? Because it's all of our responsibilities to make sure that our students are digitally and print literate. It's not just the English teacher's responsibility or the elementary teacher's responsibility, it's all of ours. So really getting kids to read, write in all forms of text. Um, there's a phenomenal article in Educational Leadership a couple months ago from an author named William Kiss about strategies that you can use to help kids read movies, read music productions, read pictures, and translate those skills into reading printed text. And, you know, as, as a bum, it, it, when I say all forms of text, we're talking about print, movies, audio, art, dance. Our kids have to be able to do all of them. And the picture that's in the background here, it's a little covered up by the words, is a perfect example. Um, there's a presenter here, Jean Feeney, she's a science teacher at our school. And like all science teachers, she used to make her kids watch the boring 1974 lab safety video. The same one you saw, it's still in rotation. 
And last year, she wanted to incorporate research, media literacy, problem solving, and technology skills. So she spent a couple of days, so once again, what are you going to cut? What are you going to keep? And rather than showing the video, had the kids make their own lab safety videos. And they learned these skills while at the same time demonstrating the standard of how to be safe in the lab. We need to fail and fail often. And so do your kids. It's OK to make mistakes. And here's the deal. We're at school. This is the place where we're supposed to make mistakes. This is the place where kids are supposed to say something inappropriate. This is the place where kids are supposed to forget their backpacks. This is the place where they're supposed to maybe make a mistake on the computer. Because all of us are here to help them to learn from their mistakes. And if we don't prevent that from happening, or if we prevent that from happening, they're just going to make the mistakes in the real world where there's no one there to help them fix that mistake. So you should be failing and failing often, and so should, so should they. We're taking risks. We should be celebrating failures. And remembering that we're the lead learner in the classroom. We're not the expert in the classroom. We're just the lead learner in the classroom. And they're going to know more than you sometimes, and that's OK. And you have to figure out how to channel that into your instruction. Of course, we have to think about access. But as we're thinking about access, that doesn't mean we have to buy every single kid a MacBook Air. What it means is that we have to really think about what tools are out there that make sense for our kids. And I'm a huge proponent of online tools, because they're platform agnostic. It doesn't matter what device that you, you're using, you can use them. They're, you can access them from home if you have internet at home. Even if it's slow internet on a not so great computer, you can still access them. And if you don't have internet at home, you can go to the public library or grandma and grandpa's house or some other place. And not having access at home cannot be an excuse. Because we have to teach our kids where they can find access within the community. Whether they're applying for a job at Starbucks or you know, gonna put together their college application, they have to have the internet. So we have to find those places for them. Um, and some examples of online devices, if you're not, or online tools, if you're not sure, is like Google Apps for Education or Schoology. Uh, Megan Ellis, I know, is doing a workshop later today on uh, teaching a, or creating a culture of literary nerds. And she'll be incorporating quite a bit of Google Apps and Schoology in her presentation. So it's a perfect example. Thinking a little bit about what devices they're bringing with you. Because here's the deal. We're education. We don't have tons of money. And so there's only so much we can buy. So what devices are they bringing in, whether they're school provided or a bring your own device program? And reasonable filtering. People, it's a filter, not a wall. It's not going to prevent everything from coming through. And we have certain things, certain categories that we certainly have to filter for. But we have to have reasonable filtering so that kids can get to the places and teachers can get to the places that they need. And we should have clear expectations and consequences you know, when we're talking about filtering. And if you need me to come talk to your IT director, I will have you happily do that. Um, and, well, and on that note, you know, most of you, raise your hand if you're a teacher. I'm assuming most of you are teachers. OK, never forget your power and your voice. You know, I've worked with a lot of school districts this summer, and they were like, oh, there's this one person in IT who decides what's filtered and what's not. There's 2,000 of you sitting in this district. Don't ever forget that. You're the ones that are in charge of what's happening in the classrooms. And if there's a resource that you need, make sure that your voice is heard, because you need to be able to have those resources. And finally, I think the, the last thing is passionate and empowered teachers. Take control of your professional learning. And all of you have. You're here on a Saturday. You could be a million other places. Um, and as part of that, you know, it can be formal and informal. It could be reading a book. It could be participating on Twitter, you know, attending conferences. How many of you have been here have heard of something called California Ed Chat? Do you realize that every Sunday night for an hour, there's passionate and empowered educators using a tool called Twitter to share resources and have a conversation and basically have a mini little professional development session? Every single Sunday night. It doesn't mean you have to participate every single Sunday night. I don't. I maybe do it once a month or every other month. But every single Sunday night, you have an opportunity to connect with educators on Twitter. There's also something in our region called Coffee Q, or sometimes Brew Q, depending on what we're feeling like. Um, but it's where educators meet informally and, hey, what are you working on? Oh, I'm working on this. I'm working on that. Because we need to find our community. We need to sort of make our friends. And that's why I mentioned at the beginning of the session today, find your community. Go to lunch with people. If you, if you leave this conference with no new friends, you didn't do it right. Make sure you talk to people you don't know. Make connections. Because you have 200 other passionate, empowered people in this room that you can connect with, share resources with, and grow as an educator. And find the community, the other the groups that exist within your community, whether that's Q or the National Writing Project or the National, uh, National Board uh, community, some group that you can connect with. And so finally, I'm going to leave you with, with one of my favorite videos on YouTube. And as you watch this video, think about how could I make my classroom look like this? 
As Audrey said, if you don't succeed, try it. Thank you very much for coming to our morning keynote. Um, we'll go ahead and have our first session, which will probably start in about 10 minutes, and we'll like five minutes later. Thank you guys very much. Have a good day. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you. 